So I'm Paul. Uh, I'm the uh, subject leader for English here at, uh, at the Kiwi for English language. And there's four of us in the team. There's me, there's Mike, there's Steph and there's Helen. So we've got an experienced big team and we've got loads of students. We've got 220 odd students the last time that I looked. So we have something like 120 students in the first year. And one of the big reasons why I'd say to, to do English language to have a look at it is that it is a massively enjoyable course. And, you know, the best advice that you can have is to do uh, do stuff that's enjoyable that you're going to find interesting. So you're certainly going to find uh, it interesting doing English language. Um, it's very varied. It's massively more varied than what you've been doing at GCSE. Right. At GCSE level, you've got a quite a strict kind of diet of kind of comprehension style sorts of things, whereas you, your A level is, is much broader than that. So, for example, you're looking at the different modes of English. You're looking, for example, at speech. You're looking at speeches, you know, done by politicians. So the rhetoric done by, by politicians in speeches. You're looking at conversational speech and looking at the different patterns and dynamics that are going on in everyday talk between people. We're also looking at the language of technology. So if you're looking at texting, and email language and language on websites, for example. And we'll be asking questions like, is this dumbing down the language? So is English actually degenerating or is it actually a good thing that there are these new forms of English that people seem to be doing, like tweeting, for example. So you're looking at those different modes of language and you're looking at, at, at written language as well. So the big thing about English, the English A-level is that it's so different, it's so much more diverse than what you do at GCSE. Okay, the other great thing about English language A-level is it's, it's really boosting your communication skills. And that could be verbally or it could be in written form. But by the end of a two year course, I'm pretty confident that you will have absolutely brilliant communication skills. You'll understand about vocabulary, you'll understand the nuts and bolts of grammar. Your communication skills should be second to none. And that's going to be valuable for you. It's going to be valuable for you if you're going on to higher education and it's going to be value for you as life skills and for future careers. So that's a massive reason to be doing English language A level. The other thing I'd say is it really sets you up with certain sorts of jobs. Lots of our students go to, well, there's a range of different careers that people go into. Quite a lot of our students want to be journalists. So there are parts of the course where you're doing studying and producing journalistic pieces of writing, where you're studying articles. So you're looking at the language used by journalists and you too are getting creative and doing your own pieces of journalism. So quite a lot of our students want to do that. Quite a lot of our students, God bless them, want to be teachers. OK, and it's fantastic because we do have a unit on English language, which is called CLD, Children's Language Development. And so this looks at the kind of everyday miracle of how children develop speech from birth. Um, and so it ties in really well with, with teaching, uh, particularly if you're somebody who's wanting to do primary school teaching. But, you know, it gets you ready for all sorts of different uh, career paths. We have students who take English language who then go on to do law, for example. Indeed, one of our units is called Language and Occupation where we specifically look at the language of law and the jargonistic uses of language and, um, you know, very subject specific vocabulary. We have other students who go on to things like psychology or media studies or film or health and social. So I would say the big thing about English is it complements so many other disciplines. Uh, and indeed, we do have students who, who study both literature and language. So, um, OK, I'm just seeing here the question and answers. I've got five questions in there. So I'll give it another couple of minutes and then I'll go straight to your questions and try and deconstruct those. I'm sure you're wanting to know what is the essential difference between language and literature. Obviously, on the literature, you're looking at the big heavy weights of writing and you're deconstructing the language of novels and poetry and plays. Language is a bit different to that. It's more looking at the language that surrounds you all of the time. So you might be, for example, comparing the way that different newspapers 
are trying to persuade you to think and feel in certain ways through their language choices. Or you might be looking at uh, the way that gender or your age is having an impact on your talk, your speech styles. Um, so it's very much about the kind of language that is current um, <clears throat> rather than the study of a single text, which is something that you do on your literature course. Um, our results are very strong. Um, something like 70% of our students end up with um, high grades, by which I mean A star, A and B. So, you know, they get very, we get very high results uh, on the course um, and very few students uh, do disappointingly. In fact, over the four years that we've been doing this course, we have no single student who's got less than a D. So if you come onto our course and you work hard and consistently, you're pretty much guaranteed to be getting a really high grade in what you do. Right, I'll, now I'm going to go to the questions and have a look to see uh, what there is. So the first question is, is there any coursework? There is indeed coursework. And one of the, the best parts of the course actually is the course that we're not allowed to call it coursework anymore. It's called NEA, which is non-exam assessment. And there are two elements of it. One is called original writing. And the other one is called language investigation and it comprises in total 20 percent of the qualification so the original writing is where you get creative where you read a whole lot of uh, short stories and then you produce your own narrative fiction so it's creative writing from that respect and the students love that um, you are you have a completely free hand in the genre that you're writing about uh, but you do have to write a commentary that goes with it in which you write about the choices that you've made. So we've got short story writing. We have persuasive writing as well as another part of the original writing where you either construct a speech or you produce an article in which you are persuading your reader or your listener over to your viewpoint. And again, you've got a free hand on that. You know, you are deciding the topic area on that. It could be something to do with COVID-19, it could be to do with betting companies in, in Premier League football, for example. So you have complete choice over that. So that's a really nice part of the course. And then the other part of the coursework is called language investigation. And this is where in the second year, you basically follow an interest in language. You collect a whole load of data and you ask questions of it. OK, so maybe, for example, you are very interested in football and you've been listening to football commentaries and you've noticed how they've changed in language over time, that you watched a very old match and you saw that the commentators were using language in quite different ways to the way that, you know, the match that you, Man United match you watched yesterday, that sounded. So you collect the data and you ask questions of that data to see whether your hunches about language are coming through. And people do literally anything. Uh, it may be, for example, you've got two two-year-old cousins who are developing in their language. So what a great idea to do a language investigation into the way that their language is developing over time at that specific age. So the course works great. It's very, very uh, big part of the course. I hope that answers your, your question. Thank you. G. Kipling, thanks for your question. Is English language a popular subject? It certainly is. We have quite a lot of students who come onto the course and they say, I'm not sure about English because I've done it at GCSE. I quite liked it at GCSE. And they come onto us at A-level and they suddenly realise the variety of stuff that we're doing on it. And they absolutely love it because we're looking at debates about language. So we're looking at people's conceptions of, you know, is this form of language correct or not correct? You're looking at the sociolinguistic areas of language. So you're looking at language and gender. You're looking at language and social class. You're taking a tour of the UK and the world, listening in and reading the different accents and dialects that you're coming across. And you, you know, you're trying to think, uh, what, where have they come from? What's the history of these different accents and dialects? In fact, speaking of that, my class next week are doing remote presentations. They're doing paired presentations to their, to their classmates. They're doing research about the different dialects and accents of the UK, and they're gonna be presenting their results. 
So I wouldn't want you to feel that it's a kind of passive uh, learning that you're doing. We, we really try and get you to be interacting as much as possible. We do a heck of a lot of pair work and group work. And obviously when you're here in college, we make sure that you are working alongside a whole load of different students because we think that's a really important part of employability. So I would can confidently say that we do, you know, our students do enjoy what they're doing. Uh, okay, if I press but is it better to choose language? I'm not quite sure what that says for me, anonymous attendee. But it, I mean, obviously it depends on what kind of books that you're thinking about. If you're a great fiction reader, then it may well be that uh, you know the, the study of literature would be preferable for you. But what I'd also say is that reading is actually fundamental to what we do here on language as well. So it may not be reading Jane Eyre, for example, by Charlotte Bronte, but it may be, for example, reading BBC websites and in which they're presenting news articles in a way to try and make you think and feel in certain ways. So reading is fundamental to it. Uh, LEC, thank you for your question. You say, do you do creative writing? We do creative writing in two ways. We do the creative writing both in the exam and in the coursework. In the coursework, the creative writing is, is what I've told you about in terms of the short story writing and the pieces of journalism. But you also do some creative writing in the exam as well, because you what you do is you study some journalistic texts where they're discussing and debating issues about language. And then you do yourself an opinion article in which you try to persuade your examiner over to your particular point of view. So it's nice that it's not just analytical writing that you're doing, you've got a really nice variety. So there's all of that going on. And I would also incidentally add that I run the Creative Writing Club as well. So we, we meet on a weekly basis and um, we do a lot of entering for competitions, for example. Uh, every week we have a go at writing in a different kind of genre. And we have a really good group of students who by the end of the year, have got some pretty well honed skills in creative writing. So you got your creative writing, not only in the A level, but also as a kind of extra extracurricular lunchtime activity as well. Thank you for that. Lucy, you're saying, do you write essays? Yes, you do write essays. So you might be writing essays, for example, about language change or international forms of English. So, for example, I have a, a class uh, last week who were writing an evaluative essay about to what extent English is actually degenerating over time, that actually language change is making language worse. So you'd be kind of having a look at the evidence on that, looking back through how English has changed through the centuries and coming to some kind of conclusion about has this language actually got worse? Has it improved? Or is it just changed? So you will be writing essays alongside doing other pieces of creative writing as well. Thank you for that. Bethany, you're asking, do you think it's worth it to do literature and language? Every year we have a small group of students who do both. The great thing about those two ones is that they complement each other very well. Although they're both Englishes, they're different forms of English. So, uh, and often are some of our most successful students actually do both. They are often students who are eyeing up perhaps going on to doing some kind of English at university level and maybe going on to become English teachers. Okay, so, you know, it's really possible for you to be combining the two of them. Katie asks, thank you for the question. Katie asks, I create books at home and it's dystopian, however, it looks at real world problems. Could this help? Okay, fantastic. Well, you sound like you've got a really good interest there, albeit rather dark if it's dystopian. Thank you for the question. Obviously on the English language, because you're doing this creative writing, which is assessed as part of your coursework, that would certainly be helpful. The other way that you can draw upon your, your particular interest in writing is in your language investigation, because it may well be that you want to be analysing some bits of dystopian literature that are out there and look at the ways that uh, perhaps writers from different ages have used dystopian fiction. So you could, for example, take the beginning of Brave New World by Aldous Huxley from the 1930s 
and compare it with the way Margaret Atwood is talking about Handmaid's Tale. So you can see that there are linkages there with literature that you could possibly make. Katie, thank you for your question. You're saying, do you have to present to the whole class? Okay, well, we do presentations in front of class and usually they are paired presentations. So um, I, I realise that it's not everybody's cup of tea and not everybody is super confident about standing up in front of their peers and delivering bits of information. But what we try to do is guide you through it. Um, the presentational skills is not a formal part of the assessment. So it's not like 10% of your A-level is going for a particular talk that you've delivered in class, which is different to GCSE level. But I think you'll find that, you know, we have a really nice atmosphere in the, in the lessons and that therefore having to speak with other students doesn't become a traumatic experience because after about six months of working alongside all sorts of different students, you realise that you're all in the same boat. Okay, so Sophie, thank you for your question. You're saying what's the average class size? The classes are usually somewhere between 16 and 21 students. Okay, and that might strike you as quite a lot of uh, students, but it's great for English language because it, basically it's all about diversity. If, we, if you think, you know, here the, the students who are coming to us in, at Darlington, the majority of them don't live in Darlington. They're coming in on the bus from Teesside and Bishop Auckland and Sedgefield and Richmond and North Allerton, et cetera. They come from the four corners of the globe in order to come to the college and study English, of course. And that's great for discussion work because let's say you're doing aspects of accent and dialect, you can really draw upon people's language experiences in different parts of the region. So 16 to 21 is usually about the number of students that are doing the class. LEC, thank you for your question. Is the course a good combination with art and music courses? Absolutely, because music and art, it's all about expression, isn't it? And so when you're looking at language, when you're analysing language choices, you're looking at the way that people are using language to express themselves. So every year we have students like musicians who do the English language course and for their language investigation, they might choose to do, for example, the language of music reviews. So they might take albums uh, which are reviewed in different publications and look at the way that language is being used by these reviewers in order to try and make you make you respond in a certain way to the music. So thank you for that, Lucy. Thanks for your question. Is this course good? If you want to be a teacher, this is the number one course for you to be a teacher, not least because we do a unit called language and occupation. And in that we look at teacher discourse. So it's a fantastic way of looking at what is going on in the language of a classroom. Uh, you've also got the opportunity in your investigation to be going into a primary school or a secondary school collecting a whole load of data and doing a really close analysis of the way that teachers are using language in order to evoke power or the way that the students are communicating in the classroom. So it's a, it's a really good course for uh, trainee teachers. Do you do any trips in normal circumstances? Yes. Where we go off to our universities, we go up to Newcastle University and we have workshops down there. We go down to York St. John University and we have a look around there. We do some work in the department. So the trips that we do tend to be based around uh, higher education. Thank you. Uh, Lucy's saying, is English good to do with geography and performing arts? English is one of those great complementary ones that links in with so many different areas. OK, so it goes particularly well with psychology because I don't, can't remember what, no, it was geography, I think, wasn't it, the question. It goes well with geography because obviously it's about communication. And uh, if you're looking at geographical concepts, then you're looking at, you know, ways of communicating those things. And I'm just seeing G. Kipling's question there about psychology. It works so well with psychology because when you're looking at children's language development, then you're looking at the psychology, like the research done by psychologists. So you're looking at behaviorism, you're looking at nativism, you're looking at these big heavyweight concepts, 
which are things that you're looking at in psychology as well. So it makes a great combo, really nice combination. Would it fit with film studies, says Sarah? Yes, it would. Yes, because obviously these, those analytical skills that you're using when you're deconstructing the scripts and film studies are the sorts of analytical skills that you'd be using and developing on English language. And Charlotte's asking, does it work with sociology? There are bits of the course that are actually very close to sociology, because when you're asking questions like, you know, is language linked in with people's social class, i.e. do middle class people use language in different ways to working class people, it's very close to what you're actually looking at on sociology. So, and sociology is one of those humanities essays, essay based questions. So it really makes a good link. And we have a lot of very knowledgeable English language students who also do uh, sociology as well. Thank you for the question. LEC says, I forgot to ask on the literature call, are there trips for literature too? Well, you'd have to ask them about that. But yes, there are, because those trips, for example, to theatres. Would you pair English language with law, says Katie Marie? I would definitely pair it with law, because law is a, le is a linguistic profession. If you think the business of what barristers and lawyers do, they don't make stuff with their hands. It's all about using language, isn't it? Either in the written form or the verbal form. So the more adept that you are at using language, surely the better equipped you're going to be for a good career in law. So we do have a lot of students who do those two together. Helen says, do you have to do the presentations? The presentation isn't a big part of the course overall. And uh, if, you, if there are serious issues with you not being able or not wanting to do a presentation, there are ways around it. OK, so you wouldn't necessarily have to be standing up and delivering in front of the rest of the class. So we can look at remote ways, for example, that it could be done. And Katie Marie says, how many hours a week of English language would there potentially be? Well, the answer to that is five. So because for every A-level stu subject, it's uh, five, five hours, uh, contact hours that you get. And then the expectation is that you're going off and you're doing independent work of around about four or five hours per subject per week. OK, so the big thing is it, it's going to feel different, obviously, to, to school when you were at school, because at school you didn't have any threes. Whereas when you're at the college, it's a bit like going to uni. It's a kind of preparatory stage for going off to uni, because in a day you might have you've got five lessons and you might have three of them where you're actually being taught. And then two of them are non-contact hours. OK, so you have to be quite independent minded, but it's not free and easy because we will be breathing down your necks if you know the work is not coming in from you. So we'll be guiding you through. And this is the final question that I'm going to be taking. And this is from Jude Kidman. Thank you so much for your questions, by the way. They've been fantastic. Is there lots of reading in English language or is that mainly literature? The reading that you get in English language is of a different type to literature. On English literature, I can imagine you're going off, you're reading your collections of poems, you're reading your novels, etc. On the language, you're reading different things. You're reading pieces of journalism, for example. You're reading, uh, you know, analysis of language. It's, it's different forms of English that you're looking at. So the expectation on language is that you wouldn't be somebody that would have to be deconstructing Shakespeare or reading Charles Dickens. OK, and the very, very final question is, LEC, how long are the lessons? And so some of the lessons are an hour and a half and some of the lessons are an hour. OK, now, hopefully that's given you some information about English language. And um, that's it from me.